Good morning. To all who gather with us, those listening on the radio and others who are present via the live stream, we welcome you in the name of Christ as we gather and worship together. If you're visiting with us this morning, we are gladdened by your presence today. Our Lenten communion services continue this week on Wednesday evening, beginning with supper in the fellowship hall at 545. Worship begins at 645 here in the sanctuary. Our guest this week is the Reverend David Guthrie, who will continue our series of reflections on the Apostles' Creed. At this time, John Mickey will bring a message on behalf of the community engagement team. I have a personal creed. Show up, tell the truth, listen, do the best I can, and then be attentive to the outcome. Now a bit of history. When I was a young man, Rick Sides asked me to be a, a member of the Downtown Church Center's board. The years of my involvement with the DCC were quite informative in my spiritual journey, and in part, why I'm showing up in front of you today. The DCC, the Downtown Church Center, was made up of seven urban churches, seven. And from that collaboration of seven emerged Crisis Control, the Samaritan Inn, Bethesda Center, the Overnight Shelter, and an after-school program. Now, back to why I'm showing up in front of you today. Right now, 22 Forsyth County churches and organizations have made a commitment to join together to deepen relationships and address community needs, 22 organizations so far. Home Church has a small group meeting to discern the possibility of us, <clears throat> excuse me, joining in this collaboration. This group wants to share our enthusiasm about the hopes of our church and our larger community through participation in this venture. We have been intentional, intentional about our discernment through listening listening to as many of you as we can. Today is yet another opportunity for you to speak with me or any of the other members of the group, Betsy and David Bombick, Catherine and Paul Morse, Bob and Martha Vito, Debbie Drake, and Bob Hunter. We're interested in your questions, your interest in being involved, Come speak with us after worship right over there. Thank you. Thank you, John, and to the members of the community engagement team. We offer our prayers today and our deepest sympathy for the family of our sister Alma Jeanette Oakley, who entered the more immediate presence of Christ on Monday, March 6th. We will offer our intercessions during prayers for the church and the world and sing the chorales number seven and number 12. We join now our hearts as we listen to the prelude.
God is here with us, waiting to refresh our thirsty spirits. Let us open our hearts and receive God's unconditional love as we pray our liturgy beginning on page 127. Please stand. We praise you, Lord. We give thanks to you with our whole heart. Great are your works, full of honor and majesty, and studied by all who delight in them. The works of your hands are faithful and just. Your precepts are trustworthy. Our reverence for you is the beginning of wisdom. You are to be praised forever. knowing creator from whom comes every good and perfect gift we praise you for the wisdom power and love displayed in the natural universe and in humanity whom you have placed within it to care for it and nurture it all glory to you omniscient God light of the world we praise you for being the eternal truth all glory to you Christ our teacher Revealer of the deep things of God, we praise you for your gifts of awe and wonder, which lead us on the path of true wisdom. All glory to you, Holy Spirit. Let us pray. God of vision and wisdom, we confess our short-sightedness and folly in our search for knowledge and understanding. For our pride in pursuing and using knowledge in ways that make us think we are superior to others, we ask your forgiveness. For our misuse of science and technology, leading to the oppression of people and the abuse of creation, we ask your forgiveness. For our failure to ask hard questions and our willingness to be satisfied with easy answers, for our ignorance of history and tradition, and for our stubborn resistance to new insights of both heart and mind, we ask your forgiveness. We neglect the study of scripture, the foundation for all true learning, Although your splendor has illuminated our path, we have chosen to walk in darkness. Although your guidance is always available, we have relied upon our own will. Although you have given us wise counsel, inspired writers, and thoughtful teachers, we have turned to our own ways. Gracious God, you forgive us through Jesus Christ, in humble acknowledgement of your love revealed in him, we give you thanks and pray the prayer he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The first scripture lesson appointed for this third Sunday in Lent comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 17, verses 1 to 7. We hear how God provides the water needed for life. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages, as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Please join me in praying the script, the psalm appointed for today, Psalm 19, Psalm 95 is found in your worship bulletin. Come, let us sing to the Lord, let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before God's presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to the Lord with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great sovereign above all gods. The Lord holds the caverns of the earth and sustains the heights of the hill. The sea belongs to God who made it, whose hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, the knee before the Lord our maker. For the Lord is our God, and we are the people of God's pasture and the sheep of God's hand. Oh, on that day you would hearken to God's voice. Harden not your hearts. Ancestors did in the wilderness at Meribah and on that day at Massa when they tempted me. They put me to the test, though they had seen my works. Forty years long I detested that generation and said, These people are wayward in their hearts. They do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath. They shall not enter my rest. And in our epistle lesson, we continue reading in Paul's letter to the church in Rome. And today we hear Paul's explanation of what Jesus' death accomplishes for us. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, although perhaps for a good reason someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, we will be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, and much more surely, having been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And today's gospel lesson is from the Gospel of John, chapter 4, beginning at verse 5. And I will be reading the longest conversation in the Bible between Jesus and another person. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, which was near the land Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Jesus was tired from his journey, so he sat down at the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to the well to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me some water to drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy him some food. The Samaritan woman asked, why do you, a Jewish man, ask for something to drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Jews and Samaritans didn't associate with each other. Jesus responded, if you recognized God's gift and who is saying to you, give me some water to drink, you would be asking him and he would give you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you don't have a bucket and the well is deep. Where would you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave this well to us and he drank it himself as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks from the water that I will give will never be thirsty again. The water that I give will become in those who drink it like a spring of water that bubbles up into eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will never be thirsty and will never need to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go get your husband and come back here. The woman replied, I don't have a husband. You are right to say I don't have a husband, Jesus answered. You've had five husbands, and the man you are with now isn't your husband. You've spoken the truth. The woman said, Sir, I see you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you and your people say that it is necessary to worship in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you and your people will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You and your people worship what you don't know. We worship what we know because salvation is from the Jews. But the time is coming and is here when true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. The Father looks for those who worship him in this way. God is spirit and it is necessary to worship God in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming, the one who was called the Christ. When he comes, he will teach everything to us. Jesus said to her, I am the one who speaks with you. Let us continue our worship in singing hymn 328, What Wondrous Love Is This?
Our reading of John chapter 4 continues with verse 27 through verse 42. Just then, Jesus' disciples arrived and were shocked that he was talking with the woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? The woman put down her water jar and went into the city. She said to the people, come and see. A man who has told me everything I've done. Could this man be the Christ? They left the city and were on their way to see Jesus. In the meantime, the disciples spoke to Jesus, saying, Rabbi, eat. Jesus said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. The disciples asked each other, has someone brought him food? Just Jesus said to them, I am fed by doing the will of the one who sent me and by completing his work. Don't you have a saying, four more months and then it's time for harvest? Look, I tell you, open your eyes and notice that the fields are already ripe for the harvest. Those who harvest are receiving their pay and gathering fruit for eternal life so that those who sow and those who harvest can celebrate together. This is a true saying that one sows and another harvests. I have sent you to harvest what you did not work hard for. Others worked hard, and you will share in their hard work. Many Samaritans in that city believed in Jesus because of the woman's word when she testified, he told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word, and they said to the woman, We no longer believe because of what you said, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is truly the Savior of the world. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, Reveal your word to us this day that we might have life in your name. Amen. Have you ever taken a journey because you felt compelled to go? Like some part of you was crying out to be there, to taste the food, to smell the air, to meet the people, and to experience a new and very different place, even if only for a little while. The gospel writer says that Jesus had to go through Samaria on his way back to Galilee. And although it was the quickest way for he and his disciples to get home, Jesus doesn't seem to be in a hurry Instead, he is described as being tired from his travels. The word used here in verse 6 means to grow weary from hard work. So Jesus is not merely fatigued in need of rest. He is both physically and emotionally exhausted. And yet, given the choice to walk the route that he and his friends know well, Jesus decides that it is better to take a road less traveled a road that many people in Judea would have preferred to avoid altogether. You see, Jews and Samaritans did not associate with each other. They certainly did not eat together, nor were they especially inclined to become friends. There's a rather long and difficult history here, marked by centuries of ethnic and cultural division, prejudice, and stereotypes. Perhaps one of the reasons that many Judeans chose to avoid traveling through Samaria was because it was just too hard to face the truth. How do you overcome the mistakes of the past and the legacy of burdens that they leave behind? The hatred and the fear that if you're honest, you still carry in your heart. What do you say to another human being, and what do you do 
after spending your whole life believing that you're not supposed to love them. Jesus wasn't required to go through Samaria, but when the status quo grants permission for groups of people, neighborhoods, and cultures to be denigrated and disregarded, what other choice can there be for the one through whom God's love for the world is being revealed? Like St. Thomas Aquinas has said, to have courage is to go on loving, even though you are afraid. Jesus' meeting with an unnamed Samaritan woman at Jacob's well is a beautiful example of courageous love and generous friendship, overcoming the legacies of cultural elitism and mistrust. Jesus initially crosses the boundaries of gender and culture not by presuming that she would want to speak with him, but by first expressing his own vulnerability and need for water. When the woman in response states the obvious by acknowledging the boundaries that exist, boundaries that neither she nor Jesus have put there, Jesus opens the conversation further by considering the possibility that they may both have gifts to offer one another. I may not have a bucket, Jesus says, but I give life to those who are thirsty to receive it. So much has already been said about the woman's perceived indiscretions. Although we have to admit our own cultural bias in assuming that a woman who's had five husbands has surely done something wrong. In a first century world that made it impossible for her to otherwise survive and support herself, let us at least consider that we don't have enough information to draw conclusions. Except for the fact that she is a woman who has endured the hardship of so many broken relationships that her character and reputation have become subject to the ridicule and speculation of her neighbors. Thus, in today's reading, Jesus intrigues us not only by his visit to the well in Samaria, but also by his willingness to befriend a woman who doesn't have many others to talk to, a woman who responds with courageous faith and by crossing borders herself, not only in her conversation with Jesus, but in her public proclamation within her own community. Come and see a man who has told me the truth. Everything that I have done, everything that I have suffered, everything I have endured, could this be the Christ, the one that we have been waiting for? Meanwhile, the disciples of Jesus don't seem to have a clue. In fact, they were so shocked to find Jesus talking with her at all that they struggle to move beyond their hate-filled suspicions. What do you want? They thought to themselves. Why are you talking with her? And does it really matter that they didn't say these words out loud if it's what they were feeling in their heart of hearts? There is tension here in this part of the story, as Jesus openly challenges the disciples to reflect upon their own needs and motivations. Having gone into the city to buy food, they return only to discover Jesus in conversation with a woman they do not know, a Samaritan they do not approve of. And though they're trying to take care of Jesus, it seems, the weight of their suspicion adds a layer of complexity to the story. It's as if they're also trying to protect Jesus from anyone who is foreign to them. Can you imagine their astonishment and confusion when Jesus tells them that he's not hungry anymore? How else could he have eaten? After all, they're in Samaria Jews and Samaritans did not associate with one another, or so they had been told. 
Jesus challenges them further. I have food to eat that you do not know about. Has someone brought him food? They wonder. It is often the case, and for good reason, that our engagement with John chapter 4 prioritizes Jesus' meeting with the unnamed Samaritan woman. But for today... During this Lenten season, let us spend some moments pondering the stubbornness of the disciples who struggle to conceive of the possibility that they have any reason to be in Samaria with Jesus other than just passing through. I am fed, Jesus tells them, by doing the will of the one who sent me and by completing his work. As if to say, because I go where my Father is calling me, sending me, I find myself in places and with people that are unfamiliar. And in doing so, I am discovering that there is an abundance available, but it is an abundance that is only available insofar as there is willingness to see it that the disciples felt it necessary to go and to buy food for themselves is itself an acknowledgement of their unwillingness to be surprisingly fed by an experience of that which feels unfamiliar to them. But look around, Jesus tells them. Open your eyes and see that the fields are already ripe for the harvest. This is very important. Because Jesus is not merely talking to the disciples about time, as if to say that the harvest has arrived. Jesus is also talking about people and about stories and about land and about belonging, as if to say the harvest is here, not just here today, but here in Samaria. And let us not underestimate the significance of Jesus' message for a group of people who have been afraid of going to Samaria all of their lives. Here in the house of your enemies, here among the people you fear, here in the place you would rather not go, here in the neighborhood you prefer to avoid, here where you are uncomfortable, here where you thought God would be absent, here where you were convinced that there was nothing of value, here will become a sight and a sign of provision and redemption, not just for them, but for you. For you. Sometimes we can only learn what God would have us to discover because we are willing to lean into the moments that we would otherwise have avoided. To glean the wisdom from those with whom we are sent to share in friendship. In other words, if we never go to Samaria, we will never learn what only Samaria can teach us. That's what Jesus means when he says that those who sow the unnamed woman and those who harvest the disciples can celebrate together. Because Jesus' engagement with the Samaritan woman is not just about water. It's about the building and sustaining and deepening of meaningful connections beyond division. Honestly acknowledging and being accountable for the mistakes of the past with an openness to the promise and possibilities of the future. Investing ourselves with listening and empathy and caring. All of which is energized by the power of the Holy Spirit who in the words of Hunter Farrell invites us to join with God and the spreading circle of relationships rooted in Jesus Christ, transformed by God's unconditional love and forgiveness. It is the Spirit 
who enables us to become the visible sights and signs of God's faithful and committed love for all the world. Fashions a people with divine love to become a spring of water that bubbles up to eternal life, that is able to give and to receive what it needs from one another. This is how we become part of the ever-widening circle of connections that Christ opens for us when we follow him. As Jesus reveals time and again that the spirit of the living God transcends the boundaries and the borders that we erect to separate ourselves from one another. The gospel writer tells us that Jesus and his disciples stay in the city for two days before continuing their journey. How? It is possible only because they were willing to overcome their fear of sitting at tables with strangers. It is possible only because of their willingness to confront their own reluctance to see what Jesus could see all along. It is possible only as they were open to discovering the promise of togetherness beyond the limits of their own imaginations, as they began to experience life anew inside of the lives of the people around them, a harvest of salvation hidden in plain sight an abundance of love and faithfulness for anyone with the courage to see it. Because salvation is here. Salvation is always here. And if salvation is here, I wonder where else it could be. Amen. Let us sing now together hymn 782, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. and every day is another opportunity 
to offer our hearts, our lives, our motivations, our desires to the God who can transform them by God's own love revealed to us in Christ. We pray that we might extend that same love to one another and beyond our doors. We share in this time of reflection and of giving. Christ, Savior of the world, you meet us where we are and lead us out beyond ourselves, all the many places and people to whom you send us. 
receive all that we have to give today. May it be yours. In your name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Lord of all being, throned afar, your glory flames from sun and star, center and soul of every sphere, yet to each loving heart, how near. That truth and reality is what we remember each time we gather to worship you, your Son, and your Spirit. We would not know you without your self-revealings, and we might keep you hidden in the mysteries and marvels of the universe, except that you have shown us, most especially in the birth of your son, Jesus, the depth of your loving kindness and your never-ending patience with us. You wait for us to renew our trust in you And even when we are far off and stumbling across the earth, you rush out to embrace us and welcome us home. Like the shepherd you are, like the forgiving father, like the spirit moving, we know not how and cannot see. You care for the world and so do we because you have called us to move mountains by faith and to believe all things are possible even what seems impossible in our minds. Help us to go with you into this broken realm full of tribulation, hunger, violence, hatred, poverty, and dictatorial tyranny, where so often death comes by the whim of very selfish rulers drunk with power and venom. Give us the love that overcomes hatred and the courage to stand firm for the fruits of the Spirit that can change and redeem humanity, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Equip us to be your servants so that we do not think more highly of ourselves than we ought. We follow you into the tragedies that abound, to the victory victims of earthquakes, floods, and fires, to the battlefields of Ukraine and the streets of our own cities and neighborhoods, always asking for your help and encouragement for those who suffer and for us who offer aid, compassion, and hope. With the psalmist we pray, my heart is steadfast, O God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody Awake, my soul. I will give thanks to thee, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to thee among the nations. For thy steadfast love is great to the heavens, thy faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be over all the earth. And now we remember the life of your servant, our sister, Jeanette Oakley, through choral prayers.
As we share in the Amen together, I invite you to rise as we sing now hymn 337, Christ Jesus Knew a Wilderness. Now may the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. <laughs>